If a brand isn't clear on the inside, how can it be clear on the outside? Welcome back to the Tailoring Talk magazine with your host for this business-focused episode, Roberto Rivilla. Many people start a business, immediately engage an agency to get themselves a logo and a website, and that's it. The branding exercise is done. We entrepreneurs rarely spend time defining our purpose, the core essence of who we are and why we do what we do, meaning many small to medium-sized businesses are often meandering around in a sea of frustration, lacking any direction or meaning to this business we've created. Arti Palmer is an award-winning branding specialist who guides business founders to mindfully define their brand and use it with intent, joy and effectiveness. She helps move owners from chaos and overwhelm to a place where strategic thinking can happen and conscious choices can be made. She takes a holistic approach to branding and stands out in her industry as someone who's able to not only help a company define its brand, but pull all those elements together in order to get that brand and its messaging out to the marketplace. I was so privileged to get some one-on-one time with Artie and I really wanted to focus on her own story because her story is what drives and defines so much of what she does and her unique and effective approach to branding that makes her stand head and shoulders above all her peers. This interview was recorded in St. John's Wood, London, outside the Good Life Eatery. Please excuse some of the background noise, but I hope it adds some atmosphere to this fascinating conversation. Get your notepads ready. Artie, good morning. Good morning. From sunny St. John's Wood. Yeah, can we do a cheers? Yeah, we can do a cheers. There we go. Uh, The input game just went through the roof there. Um, It's really, really, do you know what? Today is really self-indulgent for me. Mm-hmm. Now, I invited you on to the Tailoring Talk magazine. Nice. We just rebranded. Nice. Um, so I'm nothing if not a method podcaster. Mm-hmm. So we're going through a podcast rebranding at the moment. Okay. But I did that because I knew I was going to be with you. Mm-hmm. Um, ah, I've, so you want to get all the top tips, right? Yeah, basically. Um, yeah, no I'm problem. half Indian, which is <laughs> See ya, bye. No, I'm joking. <laughs> no, but we've kind of known each other for a good three years now, but we've never actually got to spend any proper, decent time together. Yeah, we have fleeting conversations, and then I'm always complimenting you on how amazing you look and how curated your gorgeous look is always, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I'm always starting to tell you what a rock star you are, and then, and then I want to start talking to you about branding and all that sort of thing. And um, and also just getting to know you as well, um, and then somebody in- inevitably it's what happens at <laughs> Always, networking right? events. You, <laughs> yeah. Your arm gets dra- tugged and then you're dragged away somewhere else. So this is really really nice. So I want to say yeah. th- firstly thank you first of all, and when I say you're a rock star, I absolutely mean it because Aww. you know um, as a what would you how would you describe yourself branding specialist? I would say. I call myself a brand strategist and okay. a coach simply because I am a certified brand strategist and I am a qualified personal performance coach. Mm-hmm. So bringing those two elements together um, is what really helps me to help others to have ownership and alignment around their brand. So that's a very short version. <laughs> yeah. So what I want to do first of all is go back a little bit. So we're not going to talk about branding right now. Sure. I want to sort of dig into the sort of foundation or core of, of how you got to be the wonderful person that you, <laughs> we all know and love today. I wonder if my husband would say the same. No, uh, well, <laughs> you know, he, I'm sure he would. He would. He'd better. Most days. <laughs> <laughs> um, good job my wife's not here. Um, so, um, so yeah, so, so, so just take me back a bit because you've done, you've done a few things. I mean, you know, if I just from the top of my head just reel off some of the highlights of your personal CV, travel the world, you lived out of the UK for, I think, over a decade. 10 years, yeah. Yeah, in different places. Mm-hmm. Um, you've surfed, mm-hmm. something that us Asians never really do as a sport. <laughs> yeah, I know. Because, you know, water's involved. <laughs> um, you're a black belt in karate. Taekwondo, yeah. Taekwondo, oh, I'm so sorry. Yep. Um, I did karate when I was younger. I did you? I got kicked out. Cause <laughs> Why did you get kicked out? I had, I had issues. Someone, I, you know, I'm from Croydon, right? Right. 
it was non-contact sparring and someone made contact with me and right. then I just reacted in the Croydon way and just let go. Okay, so it wasn't because they weren't dressed the part then? No, it wasn't. <laughs> um, and, uh, and what else, what else, what else, what else have you done? Uh, well, you tell me. Yeah, well, um, firstly, thank you so much for inviting me to this and having this lovely, just casual conversation, you know. Um, yeah, so, gosh, where do I start? Um, let's start with the Taekwondo and what actually inspired me to do Taekwondo. So I was wondering because, <laughs> right, because it, it was the Karate Kid, right? Yes, yeah. Now. You've done some research, haven't you? <laughs> I, I stalk everybody that I'm going to work with in what you know wherever we're doing um now this is a question i've got for you Different. i'm guessing it was the Jaden sancho jackie chan version of the karate kid because you're so young <laughs> yeah. no it was mr miyagi version <laughs> daniel son come on daniel son oh my I, I've, I've lost count the number of times i watched um Karate Kid. And actually, I'll tell you how I even got into Taekwondo. And it started, unfortunately, it started because I was getting bullied at school. Um, so I was like the young coloured kid in school. And, you know, I want to play with the girls and stuff like that. And they'd be like, oh, you're brown. And, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't let me play with them. Um, and then, you know, some of that continued. Um, watch the film Karate Kid. And I was just like, Oh, amazing, yeah, because he got bullied in that, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, he and, did. And there was just some sort of like, oh, be good to do something like like that. And you know, in my mind, it would, it would be amazing to have a Mr. Miyagi in my life. Um, but obviously, that wasn't that wasn't the case when when I started uh, Taekwondo. And this was at seven, seven or eight, I started. Um, so yeah, you know, did it, loved it. Um, ended up going for competitions and stuff and I've, I don't think I've really actually shared this but I won like um, the British uh, championships so sparring championships and um, European in my lightweight category that's brilliant yeah and it was yeah it was a real kind of eye-opener I was exposed to a real variety of different different people ages sizes all of that kind of thing but what I do really remember um, it's now at the time I didn't sort of see it so much was like the the values that they teach you the tenants around indomitable spirit respect and all of these kind of things and you're just like huh that's been actually sort of a bit of a theme throughout my throughout throughout my life in that sense so yeah that's how you know I ended up doing taekwondo but also in school um, the, the bullying also led me to play football and, and I'm sure you probably read something around those. So, would yeah. You like? So, but you played against Arsenal ladies. Yes, which I know. Is my I, would team. Have, I would have loved to have played with <laughs> Arsenal ladies. Um, and gosh, oh my God, that was such a gorgeous moment for me because, well, it was my sister's 18th birthday. And at that time, I used to play for a ladies' league uh, called Dunstable Ladies. I was 13 and most of the other women, no, about 15 at that point, and most of the other women were like 25, 30 and stuff wow. like that. And we got into a charity cup final, um, which meant that we got to play against Arsenal ladies at Wembley Stadium. So when my sister and my mum and dad, they were like, oh yeah, it's, you know, 18th birthday party. I was like, babes, I'm sorry, but I'm going to Wembley Stadium. You know, this is a one in a lifetime opportunity. But I'll be back for your your, your party. <laughs> Luckily, they, they did wait for the cake cutting for me to come back. Uh, but wow, what an experience. Well, it's another one that you can just kind of casually just kind of, yeah, I played Wembley. <laughs> yeah. I sort of played at Wembley. Yeah. But that's so, so cool. Yeah, yeah. See, I couldn't, um, see, I did play football at school. Okay. But I was, I was kept back as the token Asian. You know, uh, they just assume, okay. you know, he can't play. Did you enjoy like, it, though? Did you I like loved it. Football? You know, I absolutely love football. Mm -hmm. You know, back then, you know, my heroes were, were a lot of the Dutch national team. So players like Van Basten and mm. Ruud Hullet. Um, and 
you know, I religious. I mean, I even used to get my Star Wars figures and and sort of make my own little football tournament. Oh, was it like and, your Sabutio kind of yeah, version went, <laughs> with Star Wars? I like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Harrison Ford would be, you know, Batistuta, who was an <laughs> Argentinian striker and all this sort of Love thing. That. Or if he was playing, if it was England, then he'd be Gary Lineker because he kind of had the same sort yeah. of dark brown hair and everything. <laughs> Um, but no, I love football, but I remember once uh, we had a City of London schools tournament and they just took me along just to make the minimum squad numbers up. Oh, okay. And then they they said, oh, well, you know, so, so then they kind of divvied everybody up and then I was sort of left. So oh. they'd actually miscounted and they said, well, what are we going to do with him? And they were like, well, stick him on the bench in the A team, but he's not to play. Oh. Even my friends were like, well, no, actually, he's really good. Yeah. As it turned out, all the other, the B team, the C team, the D team were whooping their opponents like 5-0, mm. 7-0. Mm. You know what it's like when you're playing 15-year-old yeah. football. <laughs> um, but we were nil-nil at half time. Right. So 10 minutes before the end, they had to change something. So they brought me on um, for my best friend at the time. But they put me on at left wing. Mm -hmm. And I was a right winger stroke okay. centre forward. Okay. Um, but we won the game 2-0 and I had two assists so you know fantastic see that they should have bought you on earlier exactly that's it yeah, but yeah. such was the level of prejudice back then yeah. that nothing progressed after that and then even for uh, cricket and cricket's our sport right yep uh, you know I was always a scorer mm. they'd never ever put me in the in that's the in shame. the 11 yeah that's such a shame and it makes you wonder, right, what kind of opportunities could have been missed as a, as a result. And I say that because, you know, when I absolutely loved playing football, like, you know, to a point where I did get selected for, for county and, you know, even at school when I used to get bullied and that. And fortunately for me, growing up, we've got lots of, my mum's got four brothers, five sisters, we've got lots of cousins. Um, so the ones that were my age were boys. So I'd hang out with them, learn to play football. I'd then take this into school because the girls didn't want to play with me. So, the, And it was really nice at that age. The boys were just like, oh, she's got skills. You know, bring her on. And we wasn't like the last ones to get picked or anything like that. You know, they'd, they'd pick us on their team and stuff. There, I, I say us because there was one other girl who would also um, play. And then, you know, that, that uh, continued to progress. We started playing for a team, got selected for county. But in those days, we didn't have this support around the infrastructure for women to, you know, for girls to have this academy and this and that and whatever. I would love to have played for England. Like, I was, you know, bending it like Beckham way before that film came out yeah. kind of thing. Um, but I always do still think, like, I wonder what it would have been like had those things been in place. Because I was just like, I would love to play professional football. Um, so, yeah, you know, even, even like for yourself, if those choices or, you know, they were available for you and you did get selected could have been a different path right yeah I think support's really really important mm. as well because um, uh, you know my parents were never really I mean you know it wasn't I can't blame them because my dad was just working all the time yeah, trying to yeah. keep a roof over our heads my grandfather when he died and the kind of general family business fell apart my dad had to then go and take multiple jobs and then right. and then he was trying to start his own business and uh, you know he was running that out of you know one room of the house and then just yeah. working all the, all the time so he wouldn't even turn up to parents evenings and things like that right. and i think the problem that that maybe caused as i started to get older is it really not my confidence because i just thought well i just kind of started to fade into the background right. um so then by the time i got out of sixth form college i wasn't as bad at sixth form um, because I ditched all the proper subjects I should have been doing according to my parents and went and did things like drama and theatre arts and art and design and stuff like that yep. it's mostly because there was more girls in those classes <laughs> uh, let's face it I'll be Fruit honest sell. yeah exactly uh, and now you. you're in the male in the industry <laughs> yeah oh my god tell me about it um, but um, but yeah but I think when I got out of sixth form college and and then I, I wasn't able to pursue the acting thing because mm. I got a place at Rose Bruford but my mum and dad wouldn't support me to right. go to Leeds was that um, to go to Leeds or to to you know for for this um for arts and acting and stuff that I think they used the geography more as an excuse right right but the end result again you know how some mm. Asian mm. parents minds work yeah 
uh, was really that they didn't want me going down that line because they also stayed in intervention at one point I got home from the job I was working part time and my cousin brothers who you know are your older friends yeah, who yeah, yeah. kind of are like family they were at the house it was like what the hell's everyone sitting around here for mm. and 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 so we seem who was the the slightly younger of the two older brothers and they'd both got jobs in banking or technology IT whatever he said uh, well you know this is this is like an intervention because yeah. you know we need to stop you from going down this path you're going to ruin your life wow. and Sajad the older one he said yeah you need to scrap all this arty farty subject nonsense and get back to doing <laughs> you know proper stuff like business science and mathematics and whatnot and I was just like it's not going to happen um, but yeah anyway it did not mind my, my confidence as I as I got older and um, you know I think Although I'm very, very confident in what I do for a living now, because, mm. mm. you know, f fashion, clothing, the way clothing can really change the way someone feels about themselves, Absolutely. their confidence yeah. and so on, and the way other people react, because I was bullied at school like you. Right. And, um, you know, that I don't think there was a day that went by that I wasn't getting beaten up or whatever. Oh, I'm sorry to hear but it was mostly because my parents couldn't afford to keep clothing me all the time because I was fast growing. Right. Just kept growing out of school uniform and so my mum used to just give me my dad's stuff and you know his stuff from the 60s and 70s right. was all bell bottoms and whatnot. I'm growing up in the late 80s, early yeah. 90s where it's all straight legs and so on. Gosh, so just so put you're standing out for the, you wrong, know, reason. the wrong reasons. Yeah. yeah, put a big, big, big target on my back and then I started to kind of take a pair of scissors to the bell bottoms and try and oh, wow. taper them off and so okay. on really badly. Um, but I, I just get beaten up less and that's when I started to make the connection between how you present yourself wow. and how people see you has yeah. an effect on how they behave to towards you. you and how they treat you. Right. And how that, old were you at this point? I was um, it was primary school. I was with KP at primary school. So oh, did you guys go to yeah, primary yeah. school together? Wow, yeah, that's yeah, amazing. Yeah. Um, it's one of my few friends. <laughs> um, uh, it, I would, it was probably around between the ages of 8 to 11, I guess. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, by the time I got to 11, we were in year five and, you know, we were kings of yeah. the school and all the rest of it. it didn't matter, but it <laughs> yeah. was when you were younger, that was the problem. Yeah. Isn't it fascinating, though, like, you know, what you experienced between 8 and 11 and how that is connected with what you are doing today. Had you not had that kind of experience, confidence and you know bringing that out in others may not have been your your route or what you know your mission now. And I say that also because it is similar to you know when I really delve deeper. If I go layers, layers, layers into into the why I'm doing what I'm doing. Yes, it is to purposefully impact and stuff. Um, but actually, it is to help people to recognize their worth and own their value because of the experiences I've had. And, you know, I've had multiple, various different experiences, even in my adult life, which has made me feel a lot less, you know, made me doubt myself, made me, you know, just, just sort of... Um, feel low and you know all of those kind of experiences where you start doubting your own identity mm. and stuff and having worked through it you know you recognize you start realizing the importance of having the confidence being seen being valued being and I think also for me it's also the actually having kindness and care being you know somebody actually caring for you and the, the kindness really makes a difference as well yeah, and kindness, I think, is huge yeah. nowadays, particularly where, you know, we live in such a different world. I mean, especially when you look at younger people growing up, or even people who are in their 20s now. So if you think back 10 years, where we're kind of at a stage where the first iPad comes out. Right. I think it was about a decade. Yeah. No, it was more than that. It was about 14 years ago. So you think a 25-year-old now was about... 10 11 years old mm. so going all the way through secondary school and so on they've grown up with smartphones social media etc etc the amount of pressure that they're under nowadays yeah. and and it, this the smallest thing i mean we've got a friend who's um whose son is going through a really 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 tough time at the moment 
and you know it's like situation where girlfriend they break up young 14 year old love yeah, yeah. and um, you think you're never going to find love again and it's the biggest heartbreak ever right? yeah. but then you know all, a, a, a whole load of people at school then block him on social media and then you know he starts finding things out for other people and so on and then suddenly you know never mind the fact that I mean when we were at school really all we had to worry about was number one getting our homework in on time yeah. number two girls straight boys or whatever it was yeah, you were yeah. into and number three not getting beaten up if you look like us um, and and I think so So you know to my point that kindness is something that seems to be severely lacking these days and for people to show it makes such a big difference and it can have such a big big impact yeah, massive impact. absolutely absolutely um I was gonna. Oh, I lost my train of thought. I was just about to say something about. Um, oh yes, yeah, sorry. So in those days, we could, you know, just switch off from school, right? It, whatever stayed there happened there. That kind of thing. Because I remember feeling like I had two identities. You know. <laughs> the perils of recording outdoors. <laughs> But well, we are sitting in a very really gorgeous place it's right lovely. now as so well. It does feel like we're in Europe somewhere. Um, so yeah, you know, we could switch off, right? Now yeah. it just follows you around. So sorry, coming back to, you know, feeling like I had two identities. So outside, you know, obviously, oh well, parents, first, you know, um, immigra uh, immigration, immigrants here and stuff. And then, you know, we're, we're first born generation here, right? So indoors, it was, you know, real full of love and warmth, the family, community, all of that. And then outdoors was, you know, school. So there was like these two different identities I felt like I was playing. But I could feel like, okay, switch off from school. And then this is my sort of, you know, warm, loving, trusting place and stuff. But with the generation now, that younger generation, it, 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 it follows them everywhere. And that's a lot for them to take on the mental stress and you know, how that affects their, their well-being, I, I feel for them, you know, it's, it's a lot to manage and handle on top of learning, educating, education and all of that side of things, right? Yeah. Speaking of switching off, <laughs> so imagine you go through university, get out that side and then suddenly you decide to, what, get on a plane and <laughs> see what's beyond? Yeah, 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 you know, just had this ambition to work and travel abroad. So I was born and brought up in Luton. Um, and my first sort of ambition was like, I want to live in London. There was something always about London that just pulled me here and I loved it. We had cousins and they'd take us out. And when I was like, one day, I'm going to live in London. I'm going to work in London. Yeah, so I went to uni in London, worked in London for a little while. And then the next ambition was, I want to work abroad. I want to travel and all of that kind of thing. Uh, my first choice was New York. Uh, didn't quite work out because at that time they had Bunak and, you know, and we didn't have internet, we didn't have Airbnb. I found a place eventually to do an internship, uh, but just timings and stuff, it just didn't work out. So I ended up working in London. Um, and then, you know, when you're, when you're at a gathering and, or, and then somebody says, oh, so what would you like to do and what are you doing with your career and da da da? And I was like, oh, I'd love to work abroad and travel a bit. And this person was like, oh, I've got contacts in uh, Singapore. And I was 22 at this point. So um, I was like, oh, okay, cool. Did all the necessary. Three weeks later, I'm out in Singapore. Uh, well, I say to my parents, I'm going to go for about six months or so. They're really cool, cool about it, considering, you know, culture and that kind of thing. Yeah. Being a girl. Yeah. You know, I can always, you know, now when I look back, my parents have always made me feel like there's always a place to come back. You know, there's, home is here. You know, when, whenever you want, go and fly, but the nest is, you know, it's always open and welcome to you kind of thing. So that, that was always a, there was a hidden pillar that was always you know in the back of my mind I know I've always got that you know there yeah um, which gave me a sense of like freedom and like okay go and explore do this yeah um, but it gave you that grounding as well the confidence mm. to know I mean and then you've got me on the opposite side of the mirror where you know my parents would say that I could do something when I initially brought something to them but then when it came to the actual right this is going to happen now the rug would get pulled out from under me. Right. So I never had that sort of sense of yeah. being anchored, at right. least at home, and having yeah. that, or tethered, mm. 
and that which would then give me the confidence to then go out and do things yeah yeah right? and I think they had also seen some patterns in me like and I'm coming back to the football analogy because um in our community, um, there would be like football competitions, and it would be the whole of the you know national you know Birmingham, Preston, London, Luton, all of these, and we'd train for months you know to be part of this. Yeah. And I got there, and they were like, "Oh, no girls are allowed to play," and I was like, "No, I've been training for months. I am getting, I am playing. I don't care what you guys say." You know, and they're like, "No, no, we have a strict policy, no girls." I'm like, "No, I'm not having any of that." I went onto the pitch and, and played, um, and I was the first girl in our community to play. Thereafter, years, the next year and the following years, more girls started to come in, and then they started having more girls teams and stuff like that. So they they know, like, if I'm going to do something and say something, I've, I've, I've thought about it, I'm going to do it kind of yeah. thing yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah. Right? That's amazing. You were the spark that started a fire that I'm trying to think of something. <laughs> some movie quote <laughs> I'd always wanted to say it and then I got the yeah, opportunity yeah. and I messed it up but, but being serious yes. that's how these things start it takes yeah. one person to have courage mm. you know and I'm I'm so in awe of you for that and also kind of a little bit jealous isn't quite the right word but I wish I could go back to my younger self and just yeah. sort of you know just grab him by both shoulders and say now listen you um, well, the, the, the beautiful thing is, you can share. Obviously, you can't change your what's happened, but you can share this through conversations, podcasts, content, and stuff. What would you tell that younger self? Because the younger self of you who is listening to you, you can influence that mindset. You yeah. know, in that sense. Um, so yeah, coming back to. Ended up in Singapore from Singapore. I then worked in an advertising agency in Malaysia um, where I then met some local business partners and they were like, look, you know, why don't we set up a, a one-stop shop? So at that point, I'd already graduated in visual communication design and specialized in graphic design. Yeah. Um, so they were like, oh, you do graphic design. This guy does color separation. This guy does printing. Why don't we set up a one-stop shop? And I was just like zero experience of running a business and really green in graphic design why would i do that and they were like look there's dime a dozen designers out there if it doesn't work for you we'll get somebody else in and i was just like huh i've got nothing to lose really so i was just like okay cool let's do this like really thrown in the deep end and yeah. fortunately i had some really good sort of mentors and people around me guiding you know all, all of that kind of thing um but yeah it was quite quite a leap and now when I sort of think back, would I start a business in that way? No, I wouldn't. I didn't even know what brand strategy was. Now I'd be like, no, we need to do the brand fundamentals, the foundations. I had no idea, just leaped into it. Um, so basically, when I said to my parents, I'll be out for six months, I ended up being there for 10 years. Um, but in that 10 years, I'll tell you what, it was a mind opening, human experience <laughs> you know I don't know how there were so many different things like even when I say it out loud you know the people that I got exposed to who I cross paths with you know it's gonna sound really weird but like you know from royalty to gangsters to monks to my spiritual mentor to you know public listed CEOs oh my God, you, this is a whole you, other you know, podcast <laughs> yeah, yeah, expats from all around the world you know royalty yeah yeah it, it was just mind-blowing now also like when I think back I'm like wow you know but also in that everyone's just a human being you know these are yeah. yes they're labeled in that sense but the different conversations that i'd have with different people whether they're the millionaires whether the royalty whether it's the monks everyone has challenges everyone has problems everyone has suffering everyone is living life um and they are navigating life you know some in a bit more of a privileged position um and some some not so but it is just a human experience that we're all going through you know it's one thing i learned through being a drama and theater art student and studying beckett etc is that the human condition is the human condition mm. and it, we're all human we all yep. suffer it we all experience it some of us are able to cope with it better than others but at its root we're all struggling with the same yeah, thing yeah and this is you know one of the things that i, I 
uh, I've recently, well, not recently, I heard in the talk, you know, life is a workbook of problems to be solved. When we absolutely accept that, it's then about finding, okay, we know those things, are they're inevitable, they're going to happen, right? We don't know when, how, whatever and that, but then it's about, right, okay, one, how do we acknowledge the joy and happiness, you know, in moments, I do believe they're moments that's not just a consistent, you know, you're consistently happy and you're consistently joyful in that sense. Um, and two is how can we equip ourselves to manage and handle problems and things that, that will come about, you know, rather than waiting for them to come, what can we do before, because you're not going to be, pre yes, you can prevent to a certain point, but some things are just going to be some things, they're just going to happen in our lives and that yeah. kind of things. So, you know, that's where I do, and this is where, you know, when I said I met my spiritual mentor there, these are the kind of, this is in my 20s, right, so his mentors were monks that would come from Tibet and Thailand, so, you know, this is where I was fortunate to be able to hang out in, in their house, him and his wife, uh, my mentor, Master Adam, uh, in their house, and there'll be people like, oh, my master's coming from Tibet, you must, um, from Thailand, you know, you must come and meet him. And I'd be just like sitting, chilling with these monks, and some of these conversations were like really profound and go over my head a bit. Some of them were so simple, I'm like, why do we not do this as human beings? This is simple stuff, but we complicate it and stuff. So the the depth of conversations that I've had, I'm now like, I'm like, I want to go and sit with them again. And, you know, now that I'm 46, I'd probably hear it in a different way or land differently for me, you know, in that sense. But yeah, it's, it's fascinating, you know, what we can actually, and what we do have control of, um, through choices. Yeah. But it's all of these experiences and, and also you mentioned, you know, being, uh, you know, we've, talked, we've used the words tethered, anchored, grounded, etc. You know, you talk about your parents who, you know, really kind of gave you that confidence to be able to go knowing that you always had that foundation, that root where you could come back to that was always home. Um, which bleeds into what you do as a brand strategist because, you know, God knows I've met so many. <laughs> um, and... You know, some of them really do come across as, you know, maybe they studied marketing and so on. Mm. And then, you know, OK, what am I going to do now? I'll be a brand strategist, design some logos for people and make them yeah. think that, you know, they're on their way to. Oh, don't get me started. That's another whole podcast. That's that... another. <laughs> so now we've got two more episodes yeah. that we need to record. Um, and um, uh, or you get people that do branding that come at it from a, a deeper level um so a, fr a friend and acquaintance of mine who's actually based in the states joanna um she she's one of those people you're another one but again you're slightly different to her but it's because your life experiences are both a little bit different and actually i don't know if joe she comes from a faith perspective because she she went through um a period where um she didn't know she was going to live. She was oh, wow. given right. literally like months to live. Yeah. And by some miracle and also holistic therapy and so on and, and just faith, she came through that. A life thriving today is running a successful business wow. and, and she's living her best life. Fantastic. But that kind of faith um, kind of based approach bleeds into what she does from a branding point of view and with you I, I get the sense that that foundational getting in touch with who you are at a core and creating that strong foundation anchor is at the base of how you would then take because let's face it right most businesses that you probably encounter that say hey Artie we want to work with you and work on our branding and stuff firstly they probably get mixing up branding and marketing because that's yep, I'm guessing absolutely. a common one and number two they're just a hot mess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and and, and they're, they're thinking, I need to sort out my logo and my color palette. And, you know, they're, they're, they're on the phone and they're stressing it. I'm like, that's the very least of what you need to be really thinking about right now. You know, it is firstly getting an understanding of your core brand and its identity because that's what's going to then inform the branding the visual the messaging you know the photography style how you're dressed all of that kind of thing and then that's going to help to inform the marketing piece but yes coming back to 
you know the angle and and how I've uh, come come to come to this picture. So after I, when I came back from Malaysia, I went straight into my father's business, which was a Bang and Olufsen uh, dealership in <gasps> Harper. Oh Dun. my oh, is God! That, <laughs> look at your eyes all light up. <laughs> See, Beautiful. I thought I was thinking your parents are cool already, and now, <laughs> and, and oh my now God, you tell me your dad's cooler. into high-end audio. <laughs> oh yeah, oh. I, I've 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 learnt from him the you know the the beauty of sound, and you know there'll be times where I go to events or rooms and stuff, and I'm like, oh, man, that, that that trebles too high, that bass, oh gosh, that's awful, that's really tinny, you know that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so I've been my my sound's been trained, my ears have been trained. Um, so yeah, came into to, to the business because I had no um, I had no network around. Nobody knew me apart from my cousins mm. and stuff. And I was just like, one of the things I did learn in Malaysia was the importance of building meaningful relationships. You know, I, I learned how I had my first exposure of networking over there and stuff, and you know, had workshops around it, and then um, conversations with Master Allen and you know, talking about mind to mind communication, effective communication, philosophy of life, and all of these different things and the importance of you know heart to heart meaningful connections and relationships and stuff like that and I thought well nobody knows me uh, my dad's got uh, an existing business that he'd been running for 30 plus years and so I just thought actually go into his business build up my own sort of um, network and that side of things and so it was great you know got him on the social media networking because he very was very much was word of mouth, you know that kind of thing. So that was all great. Buying trends were changing. We were changing. We rebranded the shop, and then one year later, we got taken over by a bigger TV audio company. So great exit Brilliant. strategy, you know. Yeah, yeah. He got to retire and stuff. I was at a up, crossroads. Up to, sorry. So up to that point, was your dad, you know, like a typical solopreneur? So say so sort of running the business and just working constantly, or yeah, well, was he? A, 40 years he was doing the same route up and down to the to, to the shop in Harpenden. Um, he had his team, you yeah. know, um, and yeah, so it was an independent dealership in that sense, although it's Bang & Olufsen, yeah, but yeah. you know, it's an independent dealership, yeah. right? Um, so then, you know, I was at a bit of a crossroad, like, do I start my own business or work for a London agency? Always wanted to work for a London agency, um, but I kept getting rejected. You don't have London agency experience. Although in Malaysia, I'd worked with global brands, you know, Pernod Ricard, all loads of different different global, you know, public listed companies, all of that kind of thing. And then I was just like, do you know what? I'm just going to start my own business. And I started off as a graphic designer, and I'm smiling because I was just like, yeah, I do graphic design, branding, marketing, I do everything, right? Still, at this point, still not knowing really what brand strategy is, right? So now I'm like, out there and whatever and I'm like <laughs> hitting brick walls feeling really frustrated you know I feel like I'm going around in circles and I'm like everyone, there's so many other people look like they, they've got their stuff together and you know why do I feel like I'm just directionless and you know going around in these circles and just chasing another sale to invoice I then accidentally came across coaching and I did this free two-day thing with the coaching academy and it was one of these epiphany moments of like, oh my God, this needs to be part of my life. This needs to be part of my client's life. You know, they need to have, they need to understand more deeply why are they doing what they're doing and all of those kind of things. At that same time, I was coming across brand courses and then eventually became a certified brand strategist. So now combining both of those two together, you know, you've got the sort of logical side of things and then the heart side of things and bringing mind body and heart all into this together because it's not just a a business isn't just a standalone kind of detached thing the way you sell a product and service it's all about you know how you present it the what what you're doing why are you doing you know you're helping people to buy into you know how you're going to create transformational outcomes yeah. for them but you, as a business owner, firstly need to know, believe in that yourself. And if that belief isn't there, and I've seen it with so many business owners, there's such a disconnect and a misalignment. And I've even had business owners say to me, like, I just want to give up. I want to get, you know, I want to stop running my business because I'm blending in. Uh, you know, I'm not getting the sales that I want and stuff. And they're just so product led or, you know, offers led it's feeling just like disconnected yeah 
It's only when we work and I help them to go inwardly, have some, you know, self in, in, introspection and self awareness of like, actually, you know, why are you really doing this? What, what, what's driving you? What's making you take around this? And, you know, layer, going into the layers of that. What are their values? You know, what's the bigger mission here? You're not just here to sell a product and service. And some businesses are, that's fine. If they are, that's fine. You know, they're, they're not my clients. I'm, my clients, I call them aspiring legacy leaders. Yeah. They, they've got a feeling of that they are here to make a bigger impact difference in, in the world. They've got a bit of a, in fact, a bit of a calling. You know, they know that they are here, but they just don't know how to create a brand narrative and an identity around it. So delving more into the connecting strategic thinking with effective communication and more conscious conversations and getting them to be more mindful and intentional about bringing this vision to life, you know, working towards this mission and purpose, that's where the real kind of shift and transformations that's where that real energy and I always like to say you know brand is an energy it is felt and experienced and until and unless you feel that yourself from the core of the very core being of you that it lights you up it ignites you like you you know somebody could call you at 3 a.m and say can you come on my podcast and you'd be like yeah you know that kind of thing because i've got something to say i've got a narrative to change i want to challenge the status quo in some way or another i know i can make a positive difference through my words through my experiences through my knowledge through my expertise that's when you know you can really create an intentional brand that makes a difference. So bringing both of those elements together, brand strategy and you know the, the coaching side for me is what helps me to help my clients to really go inwardly for clarity and then go outwardly with certainty. Yeah. Um, because so often, and I'll speak from experience here, um, because often it helps and it helps the listeners to, to kind of hear a real example and I, time and time again I don't mind putting myself out there but very often as a business owner you're, you're aware of all the stuff internally mm. and the reasons why and, and, and often you know it might be an interaction with a client right where they challenge you on something and inside you think to yourself you don't know the, the extent the effort, the sheer amount of stuff that I go through so that you can have the result that we give you, yeah. right? Yeah, really As one good. example. Um, but but we're so busy with all this stuff that's going on externally that we never ever take time to actually sit down and say, so I, one of my favorite shows is The Bear. Okay, right. yes. Um, I don't know if you've seen it. Is that the restaurant one? It's the restaurant yes, yeah, one. yeah, yeah, I have seen a bit of that. Um, so our entire CX strategy is, when eventually we rewrite it, it's going to be based on that season two, episode Forks. I don't know if you've no, watched that far. No. Okay, just watch the whole thing. Right, okay. But in season three, and this isn't really a spoiler, but um, Kami, the main character, mm. he's writing on a piece of paper and it's very quiet so um, Nine Inch Nails is uh, god what's the song called but it's it's one of Nine Inch Nails is more very quiet somber melodic mm -hmm. songs it's probably directly on my phone at the top of my playlist um, and he's writing on a piece of paper and I freeze frame you find out what it is after but I freeze I kept freeze framing it Caroline's like why are you freeze framing the TV all the time and I'm like I want to see what he's writing the top of the piece of paper it says non-negotiables mm, love that so we got to this point so he knows why he does what he does and we're on the journey of finding out what motivates him what he went through when he was a chef in New York etc etc yeah. and all of his family background and stuff as well now he's he's again spoiler alert he gets his restaurant but um, or, or they turn the family business into and um so, so, but now he needs to kind of establish what his boundaries are mm. and obviously what the boundaries of his staff and so on. And, it, you know, that was a light bulb moment for me because I was like, I know what those are. I know what my, I know what my core values are, or at least I think I do. I've never actually taken time to actually just put them down. Just think, 
in solitude, silence, away from the business, yeah. and really, really think about why I'm doing what I'm doing. I know, I know it's all there because that's yeah, the engine yeah, that drives me. Yeah. So yeah. an extreme example is seven years ago, I had an accident where another accident, <laughs> where I was on my Vespa and stopped at a zebra crossing to let a few people cross and all of a sudden I blacked out. I felt something hit me from behind and I blacked out and I came to and a tire tread is bearing down on me. My bike's being pushed forward, I'm trapped underneath. Oh my goodness. Uh, It was the top box of my Vespa that was stopping this lorry's tire from crushing my head. Oh my gosh. So, came to, kind of worked out what was going on. I could hear people shouting at the driver saying, there's someone underneath, you need to stop. But he just kept going. (laughs) Managed to wrench myself out. And uh, I think my client's suit that I was carrying, because I was going to be delivering it later that morning, I made sure that went to the side of the road so it was out of the blast radius. <laughs> and then I, I kind of went into action mode. So it was like, right, take photos, get witness details, call my bike shop, tell them that my bike's all mangled on the side of the road, get an Uber so that I could try and get to my first appointment. All that was on my mind. So I got to Boston Consulting Group. Right. 8.31. My appointment was at 8.30. Wow. And my client comes into the boardroom and I said to him, I'm so sorry I'm late. And he said it, and then he looked at me and he said, what the hell happened yeah. to you? Because there's obviously blood, yeah. my clothing's torn, all the rest yeah. of it. And I said, oh, I got hit by a lorry, but don't worry about that. I need, to, I know you've got a meeting starting in 20 minutes. And he's like, no, 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 we need to sit down. Let me get yeah. you some more to tell me what happened. And I said, no, you, I know you've got a meeting starting in 20 minutes and I'm already late for you. Very, very extreme example. People say, well... You know, Bobby, you're quite frankly sh- stupid and you're a bit mad. <coughs> you're a bit mad. Sorry. And yeah, I I'm, I'm probably am both of those things. But the reason why my sense of, ser- you know, purpose and service and that my, the reason why I do what I do, the reason why my clients hire me is because I make their lives easier, I save them time, and they don't really need to think or worry about this aspect of their lives, yeah. is what drives everything that I do. So even a truck running me over yeah. <laughs> is not going to stop me from getting to them and doing what I need to yeah. do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, but then I don't tell anybody about that, mm. right? So that, that in itself is content in the ease, because what this demonstrates, right, is... <laughs> and I'm not saying everyone needs to go and have an accident, you know. And yeah, and I'm not saying there are, there are loads of business because, owners listening you know, to this yeah. now that are like, yeah, I got run over once yeah. and I still went and made sure that I served my clients and did right by them. No, but but yeah. that's a very extreme example. Underlying but... that is what matters to you, what drives you. And it is, it's so important to identify this and especially as you grow out a team and that kind of thing because you know you are a brand you're an identity and when people are coming into your space and serving you know your clients they also need to know what matters these non-negotiables because we get to mold that and by molding that we then also attract the right kind of audiences clients and team members because it it resonates, values resonate, right? They, they drive our actions, our behaviors, and when somebody else, and you know, we, we've probably done it when, when we've purchased from other brands, there are things that they do in, in a certain way that resonates with us. It might be kindness, it might be care, you know, whatever, that kind of thing. And we're like, oh yeah, that, that really resonates, that, that sits with me. Similarly, that's, you know, what it really matters to you to deliver to your client. And then I think these are the kind of things that makes brands stand out from other biz- I, I yeah. would even just call them businesses you know there's the brand and the business you know so this is about an identity of, of, of a brand so yeah, yeah. hats off to you and it is and the th- the other, sorry I'm just gonna no, 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 come go back to that the importance of eliciting this identity around the brand purpose mission vision values because that is the driving force and the bedrock to how you show up, who you show up to, why you show up, you know, the, the collaborations you then get to attract. Um, and it just becomes a lot less hard work because when you've got that real kind of narrative about this is what we stand for, this is what we want to be known for, it's just so much easier to then keep leaning into it, leaning into it consistently and congruently 
And then what starts happening, you know, I always like to say a brand is a combination of created perceptions. And it is those perceptions that form beliefs, create associations and emotional connections to a brand. So everything that we do, how we do it, how we deliver it, how we respond to an email, how we walk into a networking room, what we're saying, all of these are creating, you know, associations and emotional yeah. connections. If we don't know why we're and what we want to be known for in creating that associations and connections, you start blending in, you start being vanilla, you start, you know, not getting noticed and stuff because you're, you're just... Yeah, just baseline okay yeah. you know that kind of thing and that's where you'll get business owners as you mentioned before who are you know exasperated because they're not getting sales or they're not getting the right types of customers and it's and part of it I'm guessing is because all of this is internalized nobody knows about it yep Right, so you know you're in a situation with a new customer. So your existing customers might know, right, because they get to know you. They yeah. build a relationship with you. They've experienced you going to the ends of the earth in this example for them. They know that. Yeah. And if they're referring you on, you know, so like my customers will always say to to someone who's been traumatized by another tailor, they'll say, "Don't worry, with Bobby, you're he's a safe pair of yeah. hands. Yeah. Yeah. Right, he'll never let you down. And if anything goes wrong." He'll always, he'll move heaven enough to sort it out. When a new person comes in and they make a comment, and it doesn't matter if you're a tailor or you're doing something else, um, you know, you're, you, you then automatically go into sort of defensive mode and you say, well, we don't do that because, and you know, we don't treat people like that and so on. And you're trying to do it in such a way that you're not criticizing the person that they were using before but it never comes off that way because you've got that kind of arrogance behind. But whereas if you'd actually done some, t- taken some time, maybe done a bit of investment and actually gone through what you need to do to actually get that information out there. So it yeah. is actually a part of, you know, so when, you know, I always liken branding to a jar of jam. Like, okay. You know, if I pick up a jar of jam and it says apricot jam and I read the ingredients on the back and it's like sugar, apricots, a bit of pectin and whatever the hell else they put in jam. Mm. And I open the lid and it's red strawberry jam. Yeah. Well, then there's a bit of a problem there, right? Mm. Your The label on the outside, which is mainly this is us, this is what we do. And then you look at the ingredients <laughs> And then it goes into more detail. You know, we, you know, we go to the ends of the earth and la 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 la. We'll never let you down, etc. And then when the customer then steps forward and, and 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 gets the experience with you, which is opening the jam jar and taking the jam out, it all needs to be consistent and flow Absolutely. from one end to the other. Absolutely. And you know, an example of this is also you know that I always believe like it's not just about the words it's about bringing your brand to life bringing these values to life so when you do get the understanding of you know what they actually mean to you it's then right okay how do we now go out without saying our this is our brand values hello you know you're not going to go into a networking room these are my brand values you know that kind of thing you're, you're going to be living it breathing it walking it talking it so one of my clients is a great example and in fact it's the, the the vision correction clinic i'm going you know, i've got an appointment with oh. um so when we worked on their brand so there was like three surgeons merging um and you know, they've all got different identities that they're bringing to the table, right? So we did the whole sort of brand strategy going into their eliciting their brand values. And one of their brand values is excellence. So going deeper into what does excellence actually mean for them, um, I can't remember the whole descriptor of, you know, from the top of my head, but it is you know, something around the, the, the service, um, the innovation and technology side of things. You know, excellence to a seven-star hotel will mean something completely different, right? So you've, we've got to give it our own understanding and meaning because we are the ones that are going to bring it to life. And the way that they, one of the ways that they've brought it to, to life they've actually created an app that reminds their patients to take their eye drops. They didn't have to do that, but because excellence matters to them in the way that it does, these are the different ways through experiences, through delivering, you know, through delivering on what matters to them, can you then actually be 
start planting those seeds and breadcrumbs of like this is what you know this you're experiencing excellence here they're not gonna like I said go out and be like hey we're excellent we're excellent you know that kind of thing and that's what business owners need to take that time out to step back and the thing is it's really difficult and I can say this because even when I'm working on my own brand stuff I work with somebody else because it's really difficult to do it by yourself you know yeah. to to one asking the powerful questions coaching yourself through it you know probing challenging your limiting beliefs um, knowing you know how to then um, create around that it, it, there's too much going on you know when you're doing it by yourself and what tends to happen with business owners they start it and then it doesn't really get finished you know in that sense um, and also the other conundrum is we're sitting inside the jar we can't see the label outside of the jar so you know whatever it is all in internally in you but having the skill set of facilitating conversations that actually unpacks and unearths that from not just from your mind from your heart you know in that sense it's a whole different kind of meaning and understanding it and connection to these principal non-negotiables values whatever yeah. you want to call it you know you're like huh this is for example, my manifesto, I, I, you know, this is what I really stand for. So when you've got somebody doing that with you and unpacking it, it's such a beautiful experience. You know, what I've seen my clients then go on to, and this is all coming from internally, from them. I'm not saying these are your values, do you know what I mean? But yeah. I have that ability to help to unpack and then explore and elicit, elicit them in a way that is really aligned and connected. And when you have that connection and alignment, it's like, huh. I know what my idea, and you know, I'm not looking at competitors anymore because this is what's really important to me. This is my growth intention. This is my vision. This is what I'm working to. This is the bigger mission and purpose and why I am existing as a brand. And now you're not even looking at competitors. You're just like, right, I'm on my own path. I know why I'm doing what I'm doing and the impact that I want to make in this world. Yeah through these principles and stuff like that. So yeah. it's so such that's, a beautiful that's where exercise. The, that's where the coaching side of it comes yes, in, which so, is where yeah. you blended both so beautifully and so effectively because you know I mean it's the same right as you go to the gym and you can work out on your own and maybe you do that for two weeks if you're lucky <laughs> right and then you drop off you've got a personal trainer a good personal trainer or coach you show up for them and then they get the best out of you yeah and I guess it's same with this because again it's like so many business owners will, will kind of go okay fine I need to do this branding thing and I need to work out what our values are and all the rest of it um, write down all my non-negotiables but at the forefront of their head they've got all the other stuff that's going on yeah. in the business day to day I need to get orders I need to do invoicing yeah. personal taxes coming up I need to solve that problem that staff member is you know need yeah. some help blah yeah. blah blah oh I need to do that myself and then suddenly what they actually needed to be working on which is the on the business type stuff then gets pushed to the sides exactly. there's no accountability mm. and before they know it Oh, I'll get to that next week, becomes next yes. month, becomes next year, becomes 10 years down the line, exactly. and they are still in the weeds, frustrated, wondering if they should just pack it all in one day, take what exactly. money they can out of the business and just go yeah. work for someone and, else and, and they, have an easy life. Exactly. And they also end up becoming their own bottleneck. You know, when there is no strategic vision, no real kind of short, medium, long-term goals that you are really aware of and you're only working on your day-to-day, today, today. There, there's no really room for scaling and growing in, in, in that sense. Whereas when you take that step back and, you know, with what I do, I, I create this dedicated space for you because you need that thinking time. You need the right quality, powerful questions that's going to help to bridge that gap. And this is why I completely disagree with, and I see, you know, other brand consultants do this, sending out questionnaires. It, it drives me nuts because that's like, that. this is a really important part of a business. It's the whole identity. And when somebody sends out questionnaires, and don't get me wrong, there might be 30, 40, 50 questions on there. 
You're not actually. You, that, that's just them writing. Well, for a lot of business owners as, as well, is their their heart's not in it because mm. they're just being. They've they've as a business owner, they've already got a shit ton of stuff to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And now they right. I've just hired this brand consultant. They've just given me more stuff to do. Exactly. Exactly. Whereas you bring them into a space where you can have, and I say to them that I need you to be absolutely honest. You know, everything that we're, you're going to be sharing with me, um, it's confidential. You know, I, and you know, I've had people cry. Um, I've had people cry because out of joy, because they've not recognised who they've actually the journey that they've been on and the the accomplishments that they've actually had. So me giving this reflection comes back to recognizing your worth owning um, recognizing your worth owning your value because what they just thought was throw away stuff oh yeah and I've just done that oh and I've just done that I'm like wow just as a result of that these were the transformational outcomes which then has led to this 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 and what you're telling me and they're like oh my goodness yeah you know that they've gone from like narrow blinkered thinking to like this could be a mission you know that kind of thing so creating that space to actually one acknowledge their own journey and their own expertise and, and you know there'll be there will be times where people are like yeah but you know I don't really want to show up on social media and it's it's really hard for me and you know and they've got all these years of experience and knowledge and expertise and I just say simply to them like so you've gone through all this journey the 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 challenges the adversities and all of those kinds of things and you've got all this knowledge, this wealth of knowledge, and you're going to take it to the grave with you. How does that make you feel? You're not going to tell anybody about it. There's people out there that crave your understanding, your knowledge, you know, that, that, that it will just help them, even if it's 2% or whatever it is. And you can see their, 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 their thought bubble coming out of their head, like, hmm, actually... And then as we go through and we start to start connecting them to their purpose and their vision and their mission, the beautiful thing, the outcomes that I then see of them, you know, who are like, I don't want to show up to go on to writing books, delivering TEDx talks, you know, doing keynote speaking, winning awards. And these are people like, oh, I don't want to show up. And then suddenly when they have that inner like knowing and connection that they are here for something bigger and also helping them to understand that, it's not just about you. It's, and I always say, you know, a, a, a personal branding is the stamp of value that you deliver to others. Yeah. A brand is a vehicle to serve, grow, and impact. So when you can create the products and stuff around that, my goodness, you know, as businesses, we have so much power and influence and impact that we can bring to the world. And this is also why. I don't really work with corporates because I really feel like the big corporates, big institutions and stuff, they work in a very sort of snail pace and people will come in and come out and stuff, whereas with owner-managed businesses, there's a different kind of passion and purpose that they can actually bring to life and yeah. accelerate. And it's passion and purpose that's real. Yes. Um, as opposed to, you know, it's like I was in a one of the big four the other day and all you see plastered everywhere, they've got an agency to plaster their walls with diversity and, you know, we've got more women in business, etc., etc. When you actually dig underneath, nothing much has really changed at all, right? Um, they were, um, they had a very, very strong female candidate for for first group managing partner yeah and at the very very last she was out, she was pushed aside really? and a male was put into the role mm. so nothing's changed for however yeah. many decades that business has been in existence yeah. it's all just virtue signaling yeah, stuff it's all, it's... at the court at that big high corporate level and and I'm not actually worried about saying that and anyone listening to this that wants to come at me feel free I, you know and let's get you on the podcast and you can talk about how you guys are doing things differently um, but when you come down to a more sort of um, owner managed level yeah. it's coming from a different place the drive the determination etc yeah. and even if they're at a place I'm guessing where they're a bit despondent 
and they're kind of always they're on the verge of giving up I mean let's face it most of us are always entrepreneurs are always on the verge of giving up oh yeah but then there's this there's this push pull yeah absolutely. that just somehow keeps you going yeah yeah and this is why it's important to have these brand fundamentals in place because coming back to life is a problem of work but yeah what did I say earlier life life is a book of problems yeah, that yeah, are waiting to be life, solved yeah so things will be coming at us you know and, and we've got to understand as business owners we're good at what we do that doesn't mean we know all the different facets of, of, of business and you know that that's a that, that's quite a challenge for us you know there are times where I'm just like oh I don't want to this this systems and processes I all I want to do is just go and deliver the the brand strategy piece and you know but but because I've got a strong sort of, you know, my strong fundamentals, my core magnetic brand identity that keeps me in check, in line, all the times that I'm like, oh, should I just go and get a job? You know, that kind of thing, whatever. And I'm like, ah, huh, no, actually, this is why I'm doing what I'm, and you know, it, it gives me that, it, it, it ignites me again, you know, in, in, in that sense. So yeah, really important for our small business owners to, to have these, fundamentals because yeah it's very easy it, it, it's a tough it's it's tough mentally you know running building growing a business and a brand so we've got to find ways of like actually how can I make this a joyful journey a fulfilling journey it's not just by selling products and services it's about knowing what we are bringing the difference we are bringing in other people's lives as a result of that yeah where does the communication part come in? Because once you've kind of worked all of that out, and I'm guessing that's not just a one and done deal, it's a constant process because, you know, we change, we grow, we develop, we try things, things don't work, other things do, our desires change, our goals change, our needs change. So obviously on that side of it, the kind of core thing is something that we always need to be working on. When it comes to the communication side of it, is that purely marketing or... You know, because I guess people, you take the, the base kind of like, I've got my logo, now let's go out to the world. And then they kind of sit there twiddle their thumbs and it's like, you know, yeah. when do things start happening? Mm. How, how do you help people to kind of figure out the other right. side? So, so we've worked all this stuff out, now yeah. we need to tell the world so about it. So then it goes into brand development and implementation or activation in, in that sense. So everything then that's been unpacked and unraveled and you know, we now have created a brand narrative guide that brand narrative guide can now go to a web developer, a you know, brand designer, personal fo uh, branding fo fo uh, photographer and all of those kind of things because now we've got the essence, the ethos of the brand, this is the personality, this is how we want it to come across, this is who we want to appeal to, so therefore, and, and also very important, copywriter as well, you know, we're not all copywriters in that sense, so we need somebody to, you know, to, to piece all this together in a very succinct way that speaks to the mind of our audiences um so that narrative guide will help to you know equip all of these other different suppliers and you know people who can now bring the brand to life through marketing through all of these different channels platforms i don't do you know all, all of those different different areas but i equip them so they can go away or i've got my own um strategic partners that i bring in for different various um projects but What's been really nice, like, you know, agencies have said to me, they're like, oh, you make our life so much more easier. Usually when a client comes to them and they want to rebrand. It's an absolute mess. They'll, they'll be like, oh, here you go, here's my logo and my like colour palette. like a tangled bunch of Christmas <laughs> lights and said, here, you unpick that lot. Yeah, yeah. And then they'll, they'll be like, oh, oh, the agency will be like, oh, can you give us your information about the brand and all of that kind of thing. Yeah, sure, sure. Here you go. Here's my logo. Here's all my assets uh, for, for the different variations of logo. <laughs> Colour palette and font. And they're like, um, tone of voice. Oh, yeah, yeah. You no, know, we're, we're, exactly, we're the same. <laughs> we've got on our Dropbox, we've got this big PDF document that has got all of the, you know, the Pantone references for our copper and our charcoal and all of this. And uh, the font that we use, Brandon Grotesque. I don't know why. Um, I kind of like it. And, th and then that's it, right? So whenever we're working with anybody, I just send them a Dropbox link to that and I say, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah, so I've had clients where they're like, oh, this marketing agency or social media consultant, you know, they've done a really bad job on spending £2,000 a month and we're not getting any results, we're not getting any sales or the inquiries are really low and that kind of thing. I'm like, okay, okay, cool. Um, 
how did you brief them about your brand, about your vision, um, what you stand for, and your positioning in the market, and um, you know who you actually want to you know appeal to and attract? And they're like, yeah, no, I, I, I did give them my color palette, and I told them a little bit about my 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 brand. So I'm like, okay, so do they know your values and what you you know stand for? No, but I, I know I know them. I'm like. Okay, so look, this is a, a, the marketing agency or the social media I can media see you consultant. reliving this now yeah, no, as well. It, it's I can just see like, it in your like, eyes. And the thing is, <laughs> it's just like, and I really want business owners to know this because it's very easy to blame the suppliers and agencies and all of that kind of thing. The onus is on you as a business owner to know your brand, your identity, because... If you don't know it, I always say, to, you know, if the brand isn't clear on the inside, it's not going to be clear on the outside. So if you don't know what it is, that and you can't articulate clearly who you stand for, why you're doing what you're doing, what you want to be known for, all of these things, how can it then effectively be put into marketing initiatives that really makes an impactful difference and, you know, creates a, a, sales, a, 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 a sales funnel that has essence and ethos and it's not just another sales funnel you know because yeah. now there is you know personality to it there's like, like i say come in that essence and the ethos they're not going to be able to create they don't know you um your mission and your vision there and then nor are they going to be able to just pick that out from your your, your website you know yeah. in that in that sense so this depth of work has to be done if you want to have good social media advertising you know Facebook ads or whatever and stuff you want good uh, digital you know, not just digital marketing just marketing generally you know you want to be um, even PR you know you, you want to get on keynote, keynote stages and you want to be in, interviewed on podcasts and publications but what's your story where's your narrative you can't just go to the PR agency and say I want to I want to be featured in the magazine because I write about I don't know psychology or whatever because I, I'm you know I'm a psychologist. Well, so what? What's There's the like millions of psychologists out there. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So you know, even like with coaches, I've, I work with a lot of um, coaches. Some are coaching organisations, and some are just you know in, in the individual coaches. And you know how much of a saturated market. Oh my god! Yeah, everybody's selling coaching these is. days. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. So you know, when when we further del delve into them, again. A lot of it is also one, you know, you are your brand, especially as service-based business owners. What we need to understand is people ultimately are going to be buying into you. You know, it's not the framework that you've got and stuff. If I came to you and I was just like, oh, you know, I walked into a founder's or I've got my brand maximizer strategy framework. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I'm right? just, I need yeah. to talk to that person over there. Exactly. You know, why am I sitting here today? <laughs> There's been an energetic transference of trust that you said to me, Artie, I'd like to have a chit chat with you over a podcast. That didn't just happen. You know, it was it was conversations. It's how I've showed up, what I've said, what you've seen in my content that has created this transference of trust. And earlier when we were getting the coffee, I was talking about intentionality. Yeah. You know, we really, as business owners, need to get a lot more intentional. There's so much noise in the digital space. It's now about not just being visible, it's about being known. And to get known, we need to get intentional. And to get intentional, we need to have conscious conversations. And to get con have con conscious conversations, we need to be conscious about our brand, you know? Yeah. I love some of the principles there and how they're so consistent across whatever you do because you know part of what you're talking about there I was just thinking back to when so you know when we have a cold inquiry which is one where it comes from Google person books an appointment I always have what we call an icebreaker call with them mm. I don't meet anyone in person right. until I've had a conversation with them because I can't dress someone until I get to know them firstly myself but also I get to hear I want to know Kind of how they feel about themselves right now and, and what they want the end result to be like how do they want the world to see them what do they do where do they travel 
do they lead people do they do they need to present themselves in a certain way in front of people are they someone who's introverted that wants to to kind of attract people to them are they an extrovert that just wants to just blow that up even more etc I can't dress someone yeah. not if they come in and then it's like I measure them up and say right what do you want mm. I need to get to know them first and sometimes I will get people where I'll be trying to ring them up and then eventually they'll pick the phone up and they'll say yeah I know you've been trying to get hold of me but I've got an appointment with you next week so I don't understand why you're trying to call me well I'm trying to call you because I always have a call to get to know you mm. And I want to hear from you what you've experienced so far and what yeah, I love that. What you want this relationship to be. Mm. And if you don't know those things, that's fine. I've got a whole bunch of questions I'm going to ask you and get it out of you. Yeah. When we get together, we're then intentional with what we're doing. It's mm. not, oh, let's look at 200 fabrics and see if something lands. I need to get to know you before I yeah. see you. And that's such a beautiful way, isn't it? Because it just feels so much more personable. It feels, and I think personal experiences are, are, are going to be more and more important in this digital AI world that, that, we, that we live in. So I think that's such a beautiful way of, of doing it. Yeah. So, how, anyone who's listening to this is thinking, I really, really want to see how I can get to work with RT. Or at least experience more of you. And in actual fact, if you just Google her name, she comes out everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, which go. is testament to... Yeah. Um, um, but what's the best way for people to connect with you and get in touch with you? I would say, yeah, LinkedIn. So Arty Palmer on LinkedIn, Instagram, Arty Palmer. I've got my website. And there is... Um, I've got a brand quiz that people can take. It's all in my you know bio in that sense. There's links there so they can understand if they're business needs a brand makeover two minutes quiz and they get a little uh, report it identifies some gaps and gives a personalized report um and just, or booking a brand enhancement call with me it's you know 20 30 minute call where we just identify if there's any blind spots um because again you know it's that thing right we we go about our day-to-day -day but don't realize the the blind spots that are actually holding us back from our uh, impact and commercial growth yeah. in that sense so yeah that's, that's all the different places um, and I would also say you know google yourselves and see what comes up is it true to what you would like for other people to see because this is the other thing right as Jeff Bezos says your brand is what other people say about you when you're not in the room so it's really really important that we get to mold that and shape that identity and we have a certain amount of control of that so you know by actually intentionally showcasing social proof evidencing through case studies through our own stories what we do how we deliver it sharing testimonials these are just great ways to to really shape the identity of the brand because what we put out there is what people are going to know and believe right yeah. and then the rest is the customers experiences and that's again up to us as business owners to make sure that we provide them the best experience that we want them to to actually have yeah um through our non-negotiables values you know yeah. that that side of things. but that's another such a, a really really big point i guess just to kind of almost finish on because we could go on forever know, right? we're definitely gonna have to do this again yeah. um is that when people do google you very, I think I heard a statistic from, from someone, a partner that we work with that kind of optimizes our kind of uh, Google profile and we have an app that's a lot easier to use than Google's own thing, but anyway. And they were saying that the statistics is something like, if someone Googles you, 80% of people will kind of look at your reviews and things and what people are saying about you and what they see online and then they won't even go to your website. They'll just click call. Or contact. Uh, interesting. So the website is yep. actually slightly less important. Mm. It's still important, yep. but it's slightly less important than making sure yeah. that what people see when they tap RT Palmer or Roberto Rivilla or whatever it is yep. into yep. Google and what comes up there mm. is the most important thing. Absolutely. Which then and ties into. Yeah, absolutely. And it is really important as well, you know, the, the channels and platforms you're using and how you are curating them. So for example, LinkedIn, Instagram are my two key ones, right? Um, I sometimes land on people's Instagram accounts because I've met them at networking or whatever and stuff. And it's a complete disconnect. I'm like, the person I met in the room 
is not even showcasing the br their brilliance that you know i had a really dynamic vibrant conversation with somebody i'm like oh they're, they're awesome let me go I'm over on and instagram check they look like some drunk loser <laughs> Yeah, not that they've got cats and dogs and whatever. Or it just looks like somebody's vomited all over the account because of, you know they've, they've found Canva and got the latest font and yeah, template yeah. and they've got twenty different. And you're like, oh gosh, they were so, they're so brilliant. But that consistent and there should be a seamless connection with all of your chosen platforms because you're not always going to be the first point of you know the, the first touch point. You yourself. Yeah. Somebody might recommend and say, actually, let me go and check him out. Let me go and check out his Instagram or let me go and check out her, her LinkedIn. And they're looking at, oh, okay, she is. She talks about brand. She is a brand strategist. You know, I can see all the, the, the links there and it's all connecting. But sometimes I go to pages and I'm like, I don't see their, their expertise or, you know, and, and it's like you, you've kind of then like, you know, dropped off in yeah. that sense. So really important to be mindful about these kind of things. Um, it, it's it's you know it's up to us again as business owners to curate this in a way again that feels in alignment to us but also serves our audience. Uh, ultimately, that's why we start a business, right? Because we're here to solve a problem and fulfill a need and um, yeah, make the world Help a better people. place. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. exactly. Can think of a better way to end. So um, so we're going to get you back so that we can talk about um, <laughs> Malaysian <laughs> gangsters and. <laughs> <laughs> royalty, international royalty, and things like that, um, and uh, and probably more kind of branding related stuff because it's such a broad subject yeah, as well. I mean, like we absolutely. could literally just go on all day. But thank you so much. Have you had fun? I've had so much fun. You know, I've I've loved talking. Thank you for making it just easy and. Um, I could just probably talk with you for hours and hours. I know, I know that, and I would like to, you know, delve into to your brand on the maybe on the next episode and showcase how you are actually living and breathing and walking and talking your brand because I do see you doing it and doing it congruently as well. So, well done. Yeah, completely uh, unconsciously, but we'll talk about that in just a second when I stop this recording. <laughs> Arty, thank you so so thank much. Thank you, thank you so much. If this conversation has inspired you to take some action when it comes to your business and brand, head to rtpalmar.com to explore her free resources or if you're determined to take that next step, take her brand quiz or get directly in touch. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you know anyone who might get some help or be inspired by this conversation, please, please share this episode. Give the podcast a rating and review if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And if you're listening via YouTube, please hit that like button and subscribe to the Tailoring Talk magazine channel. We love your feedback, so please click the text the show link in the bottom of the show notes or send us an email at tailoringtalkpodcast at gmail.com. Take care and I'll catch you on the next episode of the Tailoring Talk magazine.